You want to buy a 3D printer for your workshop, but a plethora of available models intimidates you. In my opinion, there are only two and a half features that really make or break a printer in terms of what you can do with it. Especially as a beginner, you probably put way too much emphasis on things that you later find out you don't really need. So let's dive right in. Welcome back factory owners and those aspiring to become one. This video is about making the right choice for your first printer so you can avoid the regrets that I had pretty quickly when I got my first machine. It's a re-recording of my first video. I wasn't satisfied with how it turned out, but I think the message is still valuable for many people. Besides those criteria, there's of course a thing called build quality, which makes a big difference when it comes to longevity and maintenance, but this also depends on how often you're printing with it. And let's be real here, once you really get into it and realize the parts and tools you can create, you'll feel the itch to buy more printers anyway. So don't feel bad if you're starting with a really cheap model to see if 3D printing is actually for you. Also, don't worry about print quality too much, since even the cheapest models on the market are capable of making decent prints nowadays, especially for technical parts and tools, which this channel is all about. If you're really committed and can spare some extra cash, there's nothing wrong with buying a more expensive model. They usually come with a variety of comfort features like automated bed leveling and predefined profiles for different print materials. In general, they make focusing on your designs easier because there's less tinkering necessary. Every 3D printer needs a motor to push the filament through the hot nozzle. One way to do this is a Bowden system. That means the extrusion motor is mounted to the frame, pushing the filament through a long PTFE tube into the moving printhead. The advantage of this system is you don't need to move the heavy extrusion motor around, which means the printhead can move faster. But that doesn't automatically mean you can print faster, since in most cases the maximum amount of plastic the then can melt in a given time is the limiting factor. Especially if you're using tweaks like a wider extrusion width in the slicer. You don't even need a larger nozzle for this. On the negative side, the longer tube has quite a bit of slack. That means retractions, where the extruder pulls the filament back a bit to prevent it from oozing out of the nozzle, need to go for a few millimeters instead of sub 1 millimeter for direct extruders. This makes printing flexible materials like TPU quite a bit harder. They are also susceptible to stringing, that's those fine spider web like strings from one point to another in the print. Bowden extruders are most prominently present in cheaper printers, but that doesn't mean it's a telltale sign of a cheap printer. There are quite a few high quality printers with Bowden systems on the market. And when it comes to world record printing speeds, there's no way around a Bowden system. But if your printhead is moving lightning fast, there's virtually no need for retractions anyway. Direct extruders, on the other hand, have the motor sitting right above the extruder. This minimizes slack as much as possible. It also makes printing flexibles much easier and reduces stringing quite a bit. But the higher weight makes vibrations in the frame more prominent and amplifies a phenomenon called ringing. The result is you can see those vibrations as artifacts in your prints. Those artifacts have no impact on the strength of your prints and many modern printers come with a feature called input shaping which reduces those vibrations. With that being said, I would always opt for a direct extruder if I have to choose and it fits the budget. There's simply no real advantage in regular everyday use for a Bowden system if your goal isn't printing ridiculously fast. While this is not as fundamental of a difference as the extruder type, it limits the choice of filament you have. I'm talking about PTFE tube lined versus all metal hotends. The former are present in pretty much all cheap printers today. Using PTFE lining makes sure the filament can easily move inside the hotend. All metal hotends need to be polished smoothly to achieve the same effect. This makes them a bit more expensive to manufacture. In theory, cheap all metal hotends could have random jams if they're not polished smooth enough, but in my experience, even the cheapest all metal hotends did not cause any problems for me yet. Unfortunately, PTFE has the nasty habit of emitting poisonous gases if it gets too hot. The same thing that happens with Teflon coated pants. After all, Teflon is just a brand name for PTFE. Conventional wisdom says it's safe to use up to around 250 degrees Celsius, but that only marks the breakdown temperature of the material. It can even emit gases below those levels. I personally have printed ABS at around 255 degrees in the past without dying on a cheap quality CR10, but it doesn't mean I would recommend it. Other materials like polycarbonate and nylon need quite a bit higher temperatures, around 275 degrees give or take, so an all metal hotend is mandatory for those. On the other hand, those are pretty advanced materials and can be a nightmare to print. I wouldn't recommend them for a beginner. You can upgrade any printer to an all metal hotend, but depending on the availability of ready made parts and how the hotend is assembled, this can take anywhere from a few minutes to several hours of tinkering. Since my focus is all about productivity, I recommend getting an all metal hotend right from the start. If you're on a budget, there's also nothing wrong with a PTFE lined hot end on a cheaper printer, but keep in mind to don't go above the recommended temperatures. Certain types of materials are hard to print since they tend to warp. This means altering its shape from internal stresses because of temperature differences. Usually this means the print will pull its edges from the heated bed and eventually fall off completely. Even if it sticks till the end, those stresses can form cracks at the layer lines. 
those materials are virtually impossible to print without an enclosure. Some of those materials are ABS, nylon and polycarbonate. The reason why I assigned this feature only half a point is you don't necessarily need an already enclosed printer. You can just put the printer in any kind of enclosure. There are many options. The cheapest one is simply putting a cardboard box over the machine. Modifying an IKEA LAC table is also quite popular. You can also build a custom case out of wood or aluminium profiles. I did one form of all dimension variants myself at some point. Today I'm still using a custom wooden enclosure for my Prusa Mark IIIs with great success. The only thing absolutely crucial is to place the power supply outside the enclosure to avoid overheating in the long run. For occasional usage of a cardboard box you can get away with keeping it attached to the printer. With my enclosure I've experienced issues when printing PLA. The internal temperature gets to around 40 degrees, this makes the material get soft too soon and causes heat creep. That means it's getting stuck inside a heat break in the middle of the print. The heat break is that fan cooled part with fins on it. But there's an easy fix, I just leave the door open when I'm printing PLA. These are in my opinion the most important points to look out for when choosing your first 3D printer. In short, get a direct extruder with an all metal hot end, decide if you want to have it enclosed by design or build an enclosure yourself in case you need one. Of course there are other choices you have to make, but these are answered pretty quickly. Never buy a machine without a heated bed and choose bed size rather smaller than larger. Only go large if you already have a very specific project on your mind you need to build volume for. When I got my first printer I thought I needed the largest machine I could get my hands on. I've only made use of the large build plate twice in 2018 though. Today I'm printing almost all of my designs on my 120mm Boron 0.2 you can see in the background. To help you get good results as fast and easy as possible, I made a free guide on how to approach designing and printing practical parts. You can download the guide with the link in the description below. And thanks for applying some solid infill to the like button while you're at it. Hopefully this made your choice a bit easier. Don't forget to subscribe over here. And if you want to learn the mistakes I did when I first started 3D printing, there's a video over there. See you in the next one.